session you are here for is getting out of cloud jail or how to scale down your costs after you scaled up your business. And just as proof that I'm not some sort of roguish imposter, that's me up there in the lower right hand corner. Uh, so just to be clear, because of the clickbaity title, I want to make sure everyone here knows what they're in for. We're actually here to hear a story about enterprise cost savings. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Sorry, all the other sessions are now full, so you're stuck with me here. Uh, but uh, it, it'll be interesting. Stick with me here on this. Uh, so of course, what I suspect most folks are, are curious about is what is cloud jail? Uh, so you know, if you've ever been part of a startup or any sort of product initiative at all, usually the beginning of that product initiative is focused less on building something that can scale efficiently and more on building something that's worth scaling at all. Uh, product market fit is what it's all about. And product market fit is usually determined by development velocity. And development velocity and building for scalability, while not orthogonal, are often at loggerheads with one another. So of course, you build things quickly to get to the point where you start to get product market fit, and then there's that oh crap moment where it turns out you may have actually achieved that. Well, <laughs> they get started early over there. Um, so, uh, so right. The second part of this, of course, is cloud services. So, of course, the defining characteristic of cloud services is elasticity. That's what the E is in ECS. That's what the E is in EC2. That's what the E is in EBS. That's what the E is in EKS. There's a lot of E's going on in the AWS ecosystem. And of course, elasticity is very useful when you desperately need to scale. Because instead of having to re-architect anything, you can just whip out the proverbial credit card and get through the night, and get through the pages that are happening at 3 a.m. because of that scale, and get through the pages that then happen at 6 a.m. and then 7.30, and just keep cranking up that dial to get through your hockey stick growth. But of course, if you keep doing that, eventually, you start running into some compound interest. So that's what cloud jail is. Cloud jail is any case where you use the ease of scaling up cloud services to buy your way out of technology scaling challenges, resulting in getting yourself into that dead end, where you're trapped with high costs, low margins, technical debt, and oh yes, you still have to keep making the product better too to make sure it continues to be something worth scaling so your competitors don't eat you alive. And then what's important to note, that's not my term, that's actually from Avi Friedman, CEO of Kentic, a big network monitoring solution out of San Francisco. Temple L, uh, who coined this in a first round uh, Gazette essay three years ago. So if you're interested in that, uh, check that link. Ask me how I know all about cloud jail. That's OK. I'll ask myself. So um, first, let's give a little bit of context of Toon, the company that I work for. So Toon, we're headquartered in Seattle. Yes, I did fly in in the red eye this morning. If this isn't as lucid as it maybe could be, that's why. Uh, we have offices all around the globe. We've got 36 million in venture funding from Excel and Icon Ventures. And we have two products, uh, or we did have two products up until very recently, a partner marketing SaaS solution, so a SaaS product that powers partner marketing engagements, affiliate networks, things like that, and a mobile app install attribution product, a tool that helped determine what the source was for mobile app installs so marketers can plan budgets, pay their partners, and understand where their revenue and where their new users are coming from. And so these are both products that achieve that proverbial hockey stick growth. Both of them you know, saw that apex happen. And it happened around the same time. So a typical month for us is traditionally about 100 billion or so tracked events. We're talking about clicks, impressions, and conversions. And like with any sort of number like that that deals with engineering scale, half the room is like, wow, that's a lot. And the other half is like, yeah, it's 100 billion. Call me when you get another couple zeros. So, you know, it's, it's for us a considerable amount of scale. And so the challenge, of course, is both of those hockey stick apexes happen around the same time. Uh, so tune, let's go all the way back to 2016. Uh, so where were we in 2016? Our process traffic, which again are clicks, impressions, and advertising conversions, uh, had tripled year over year for about three straight years. And our costs were rising inconveniently more than linearly with this tripling of our traffic. Uh, and at this point, we had become distressingly good customers of Amazon Web Services. Uh, we were getting some great attention uh, from our account management and everything else. 
and um, you know, we're, we're talking you know, cases we're spending well upwards of seven figures a month uh, in AWS, and you know, that's a manifestation again of us potentially being in cloud jail. Uh, but you know, the thing, of course, is that we also had to keep making the product better. There is no pulling the handbrake on product development, especially when you are a you know, proverbial software startup. You've got to keep making the product better. And so that's tuned in 2016. Tune in 2017, now it's this guy's problem. So I started as CTO of Tune uh, in January 2017. And actually CTO, that meant head of both product and engineering. So this is my story uh, in terms of helping to get us out of cloud jail. So we're going to be walking through a number of different things, axioms of what worked and didn't work while we tried to change the tires on the proverbial truck uh, while it was in mid-motion. Uh, in terms of getting our costs under the control, getting out of cloud jail while continuing to make the product better. This story has a happy ending, and your story can have a happy ending too. Or maybe you won't even have to have this story. Or maybe you're looking at this smugly and thinking, I'd never get in that situation. All of those things and more we'll experience over the next 35 minutes. So, nine axioms on getting out of cloud jail or avoiding it entirely. Let's just tee things up very quickly and first start with cost savings. Uh, cost savings is a joint product and engineering effort. Uh, this is a really important thing to emphasize. This is first because it is the most important thing to note. Uh, again, how do you get into a scenario where you're in cloud jail in the first place? Uh, by iterating quickly on product decisions. That's how you get there. Uh, and you do that to find and maintain product market fit. As any startup, as any product, as any feature offering, even within a big legacy enterprise, needs to do. And frankly, you can never stop doing that. You must always be on the hunt for product market fit. And it doesn't matter if you are you know, at a giant company. It doesn't matter if your technology is a cost center in your company and your customer is internal. Doesn't matter if you're a startup, doesn't matter if you're 150 years old, doesn't matter if you're IBM, it doesn't matter if you're in a garage. You can never stop working on product market fit, ever. Uh, and so it might even have been rational to get in the cloud jail because that's what it took to get the velocity necessary to make something worth scaling. You must always remember that. But of course, in the process of doing that, uh, not all of the decisions that you made in that process may have paid off. Actually, as a matter of fact, if, unless you have you know, some sort of eerie uh, prescience, you know, Paul Atreides style, uh, you almost certainly have not made all decisions that have paid off. Uh, there are certainly a number of things that your product or feature set uh, are doing that it does not need to do or are extremely expensive to power, uh, and those expenses might be coming straight out of your bottom line. Uh, and so you might have these features that are around, they're expensive for you in terms of maintaining them, but they're also expensive for you in terms of literally cost against your AWS bill. And so engineering really does need to be enabled to make product modifications that may change capability in the pursuit of lower costs. You know, product cost is not solely an engineering responsibility. It needs to be done in concert with product decisions. Uh, and that enablement comes from either a strong product organization or the engineering organization having the ability, the responsibility to be able to make calls about what the product itself actually does. Uh, because if you don't have that leverage, if you don't have the ability to say, our product is going to stop doing this, or our product is going to do this a little bit differently, or our product is just going to cut this limb off of itself, you're not going to get anywhere that quickly because what you'll end up doing is uh, holding yourself beholden to a lot of product decisions that have low customer value but have a lot of cost associated with them and tearing yourself up in the knots to actually support that. In other words, if engineering is not enabled with product calls, you will move very slowly in extricating yourself from cloud jail. Ask me how I know. So let's relate this to a little bit of the experience at Tune. So, Tune itself, uh, you know, for both of the product lines coming up in 2016, 2017, had built an incredibly diverse feature set to meet the customer set that we were appealing to. And some of those decisions included never, ever, ever throwing data out ever. So at this point in 2017, Tune had been around for eight years. And we had 
data not only around for that entire length of time, but in semi-warm storage. Uh, so this is not just you know, archived in some sort of warehouse, but actually in queryable state going across that whole history, uh, and exportable in that history, and accessible in that history. And so naturally the question comes, why? Is it actually important? Is this a strategic advantage? Is this a competitive advantage? Is this actually necessary? Because it certainly costs us a lot of money. And so we dug into the data. The product and engineering teams, this is where it's useful to have them both co-located, both working together as single units. Uh, but they dug into query patterns. What are people actually accessing? How often do questions come through support? How often are people actually querying this whole history? And it turned out, actually, for many of these different forms in which we're exporting data, 120 days was enough, or a year was enough, or 25 months was enough. And there's so much data that we could th then extricate as a result of being able to make that call. Why did it take us that long to come around to it? Because up, in the, up until that point, we had never invested the time to actually get the data to feel confident in making that call. How many folks have been in this room where you're trying to make a hard decision, it seems like there's solidarity in the room that we're gonna make the hard decision, and there's one person that pops up and says, yeah, but this one customer may care that this might actually be a problem. I think they're using that feature. How many folks have been in that room where that's happened? I expect to see a lot of hands, yes. Uh, usually the room stops cold when that happens. Uh, because, you know, who, how can you argue against the kind of vagueness that's there? Because it's, it's elusive. It's like, well, that customer is important. You don't want to give up on customers. It's the data that enables the backbone in making the call. It's also the backbone that enables the backbone in making that call. Sometimes you've just got to say, F it, we're doing it anyway. Uh, and that uh, is, again, a product call that enables things. And we made product calls like Tune to help extricate us from this. Uh, other things, uh, again, that we did uh, related to reporting archiving. So uh, reporting cubes. Uh, for those, how many folks here have built an OLAP cube or some sort of reporting cube over the point of so a few hands? So if, whenever you do sort of an analytics product or any product that involves taking you know, many, many, many billions or trillions of discrete individual points of data and then needs to report on them in some way, you usually end up building a, a data cube, which is basically a, a dimensional cube that you know, collates the data across, across all the different parameters that are there to be able to look up the results in a cell. And how many folks are familiar with the term cardinality? So if you have dimensions that are in your cube that have unique level cardinality, you don't have a cube, but you have is a log record. Because anything that has unique level cardinality is never going to aggregate at least for that, anything that intersects with that dimension in your cube, because they're unique. They'll never pair with anything else. And so we had a number of cases where we had unique level reporting queries that were happening, which were extremely expensive, extremely difficult to satisfy, had very little customer value attached to it, because who wants to see a report that has 886 million rows in it, because you queried on the one row column that had unique values for every possible entry or data value that we received. Uh, and also was incredibly expensive to solve. Just the systems involved, the engineering time, the actual data storage in order to fill, were all bound up in us saying we had to support this fidelity of querying. And so again, we looked at the data and realized people don't query on that stuff. And those who do never get the reports back because they time out. So they end up exporting them and figuring out alternate ways to crunch that data. And so again, through judicious use of product decisions, we actually managed to meet the customer need in a much less expensive manner. So again, just to restate, uh, cost savings is a joint product and engineering effort. So if you are ever in any sort of cost saving situation, cloud jail or whatever else, just remember this. It's a joint product and engineering effort. And if you're on the engineering side of things and it's thrown at your feet to say, you know, save costs, do whatever it takes, Remember that without product support, it's going to be very hard. And you should campaign for that. Second thing, visibility is power. So I know I've cited uh, going to the data many times. It is astonishing how often uh, that in, in companies in my history, working across many different places, they're aware that their software is expensive, but they don't know how or why it's expensive. There's a few senior engineers that know, oh, yeah, our data store, oh, that's got to cost us so much. No one actually has the number. 
get the number. You must have an understanding of where your costs actually come from and how they map onto your technology. And if you don't have it, that is mission number one to doing anything about your COGS, about your costs of goods sold. You absolutely must know where your costs are actually coming from, and it can't just be intuitive. The intuition helps, but this should all be very measurable, especially because if you're on the cloud, if you're in cloud jail, AWS, Google, Azure, they are all collecting this data for you. It is all there to perform data science on. Same as your logs flow, flowing into your ELK stack, your cost data can just as assuredly flow in as well, and actually a very similar format. Other thing I want to point out about this is if you are using cloud-based services, the data is there. You do need the discipline to make it useful, uh, and that involves tagging. So it's one thing to say our EC2 costs are really high, or our S3 costs are really high, or our SQS bill is crazy, or our Lambda bill is crazy, or there's 115 AWS services. I don't have to say the same thing for all 115 of them. Uh, but it's one thing to know on that level that your costs are high. But that's not how your software is built. Your software is built according to your internal services. You know, you build your bunging service, your you know, data cubing service, your FUBAR service, some services you've built internally. That's the way your technology is actually constructed. If you have, it doesn't matter if you have a monolith or microservices technology, you know, streaming data pipelines or you know, machine learning algorithms that are running underneath the covers or data science or whatever you're doing, you tend to build your own capability by services and Conway's law being what it is, you tend to build your teams around the way that those services are constructed. Actually, it's the other way around. Your services tend to be constructed the way your teams are actually set up. And so if a team is going to help reduce cost, they don't, it's not especially useful to know we're paying $480,000 a month in EBS costs. Uh, what is useful for them to know is your service has a total cost to operate of $517,000 a month, which is partitioned in these ways. Uh, and that comes from tagging. It comes from actually making sure your data for your cost is collated by how you think of the systems and not how AWS or GCP or Azure thinks about their systems. Because that's how you can actually mobilize to execute on these things. So ask me how I know. Uh, Attune. Here's an example of some of the, uh, the different dashboards that we put together. And this is in Datadog, so we're, we're routing all the data. We also use Kibana as our, uh, as our uh, data cruncher. So you can crunch the actual cost data, and Amazon has some pretty robust cost APIs, the same way you would crunch your own you know, API query logs. It can be done in a very similar way. You just have to make sure everything gets tagged properly so that this is meaningful to you and you can actually take action on it. Uh, so a couple of examples of how this manifested itself for us. Uh, we saw, we, we used to think that most of our costs were bound into select services like DynamoDB and EC2 and the actual amount of compute and storage we were provisioning. We learned that we were paying a ton in data transfer. Reason why is we had a Kafka cluster through which all of these hundreds of billions of events were going through. Kafka cluster, how many folks are familiar with Kafka here? Yep, so Kafka cluster with Kafka 09, they introduced distributed Kafka. You set up ISRs, which can then replicate, so you've got failover and other things. And if you set your ISRs up across availability zones within an AWS region, all of those billions of events are going to be chatting to each other across the AZ, which means effectively you're repeating every byte of data that you're receiving intra AZ, which costs money. And in our case, it costs a pretty significant amount of money. It's not money we would have been aware of unless we had actually crunched the numbers to understand what the root cause was, which allowed us to do data packing and all sorts of other things. Same, through, same thing with uh, SQS, for example. If you use SQS as a queuing service, uh, SQS charges you by the message transferred. So if you're not doing any sort of data packing, when you're actually trying to transfer data from one system to another, again, you're going to end up paying uh, big time bills. And it's not something one might intuitively think of, it might not be in your intuition when you're actually thinking about where the opportunities are to save. So get it on a dashboard, look at the numbers, let the data actually tell you where to spend your time. Because again, you've got to keep making your product better while this is all going on. And if you spend 
a week putting this together, it may save you three months of developer's time that you spend trying to re-engineer a system that isn't actually where your cost is, while you're leaving the low-hanging fruit over here just dangle in front of you, unbeknownst. Third thing, check your state full systems. So I've already talked a little bit about this. Chances are a lot of your system costs are bound up in your state, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Uh, you know, state that you keep around is your number one cost driver, and cost savings often begin there. I'm going to bring up this triangle, which I found is always very useful for me when I'm considering uh, storage concerns, where data is going to go, what's hot store versus cold store, and what I want to do. Typically, when you're picking a solution for how you are going to store data in your system, you are picking a spot in this triangle around speed, queryability, and cost. Uh, and you've got to pick some spot in there. So for example, on the extreme case, let's say you put your data on a local tape drive. You know, For those of you who actually remember tape drives, that would be nestled very tightly in that vertex at the top of the triangle. Uh, very, very cheap, but of course, anyone who's ever actually done anything with a tape drive, extraordinarily slow and could not be less queryable. Chances are, again, if you are either, again, a young company, a startup that's getting going, that's starting to experience that hockey stick growth, or if you're building you know, some sort of you know, skunk worksy project in a larger organization, you've wittingly or unwittingly indexed the bottom half of the triangle because speed and queryability represent flexibility. If you have flexibility, that gives you the product capability to be able to actually hit on product market fit. If you can flex without incurring significant costs, you're a lot more likely to find that local maximum. Hopefully, you're already on the right hill, but you're a lot more likely to find the local maximum in the product that you're building out. So wittingly or unwittingly, you've indexed the word speed and queryability. And of course, once you've found that fit, now all of a sudden you've got your data in something that's indexing away from the cost angle and then kaboom, it'll take off on you in a hurry. And so that's where you've got to start to do the work. And again, it comes back to product decisions. It also comes to product technology decisions as well. How do you, in, what, where are the sensible ways in which you can move towards the cost vertice while making the right concessions against speed and queryability? Uh, and that's where the architecture work comes in. So, a couple other things to note, if you don't have data deletion systems, your costs will indeed increase monotonically. Uh, monotonically increasing costs are a very bad thing. If you have costs that just go up and never ever go down, uh, that's one chart you don't want going up and to the right when you're doing your quarterly report to your board. Uh, so if you're not deleting data, you can't help but have monotonically increasing uh, storage costs. Bear that in mind, again, also when you're picking technology as well. And then the other thing to note is that uh, data is intimidating to deal with. Uh, when it comes to a product capacity, when it comes to an engineering capacity, uh, you know, data can be intimidating when it comes to being able to move quickly and moving it around and dealing with those systems. And I, I use the term intimidating here consciously. Um, how many folks here you know, deal with data because you're a DBA, or you're dealing with scaling systems, or you're distributed? I'm going to just keep making you raise your hands, trying to get some calisthenics in. Um, you know, again, the, the tricky thing, of course, with data is it is possible to lose it. Uh, and for a lot of businesses, or a lot of you know, areas within larger businesses, losing data is the cardinal sin. That is the existentially wrong thing that you can do uh, when it comes to actually uh, handling what your business is doing. So it tends to make folks, quite rightly, very conservative when it comes to handling their data and doing things conservatively from an engineering perspective where most of your costs tend to be in time and energy and labor, uh, conservative means expensive. So what should you do? Well, big first thing is set sensible limits on your data retention. And I should note your compliance and privacy people will thank you for this. Don't keep data around forever. And it's not just because it's expensive, but it's also because of GDPR and the California legislation that's going into effect in January and the 11 other states have uh, passed similar things to that and COPPA and the new Korean legislation that's through. There are so many different reasons why 
You don't want to keep data around forever. You just have to make the time to get rid of it. Uh, the reason why most companies tend to keep data around forever uh, is because they don't want to take the time to get rid of it. Uh, not so much that they actually want the whole history, but it's actually easier to just keep it than to drop it. Second thing is uh, make sure that your raw data authoritative store is completed, trustable, and in cold-ish storage. So again, so many businesses and so, so much of technology is I accept these little tiny bits of discrete events from the whole universe, you know, these millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions, trillions of little data points, touch points, analytics points. I receive them, I ETL them, I warehouse them, I query them, I throw them on a screen. Uh, and if that is your business, and chances are you have some element of that in just about any kind of software that you actually touch, uh, make sure that you make the right decisions about your coldest storage. Where is the actual record of every single thing that you want to keep? Uh, oftentimes, folks throw this on S3. It's the most common thing. You know, S3 in parquet format, or, SB, or S3 in flat buffer format, or um, you know, HDFS is a common store for this. You know, your coldest, coldest of cold storage for just the whole kind of time series record of everything you've ever done, that's uh, what you want to make sure is in great shape. Because as long as that you can trust, you can always cube up. You can always go further up the pyramid to compile it and make it and store it in the hotter store for more queryability and for more, uh, uh, more speed. But you can never go the other way. Once the data is gone, it's gone forever. So as long as you've got that net of trustable data in a cold store, that relieves some of the intimidation factor of being able to move up it. But make sure you've got that net underneath you, or you'll move so slowly on this that you won't get anywhere. Third thing is uh, move with confidence uh, once you've got that net on constraining the data that you store hot. Uh, we're going to talk about Tune and what we've learned about this. But um, again, the fastest way to actually, you know, to, whoa. Uh, everyone can hear me, by the way, right? Just a quick audio check. I don't really need the mic. I'm just naturally loud, but uh, it's good. Everyone can hear me in the back. Um, uh, but um, it's the fastest way to really hurt yourself is by keeping too much in hot storage and by having a uh, product uh, market fit that's dependent on a product that requires keeping too much data in hot storage. Unicosts are important. Uh, one important thing to note about all of this is it's so easy in software to ignore the actual technology unit costs. So. You know, if I were in manufacturing, what is the first thing that I compute about anything I make? It's the bill of materials. It's the actual you know, raw cost of the stuff that I'm selling before I assemble it and engineer it and package it and everything else. That's what I determine. My margin is determined from that gap. Or if I'm in a consulting engagement, typically I'll compute the margin on the time I'm selling, the margin on the deal. But in the software world, especially the SaaS world, it's so easy to not think about margin because you think, oh, you know, all the costs are R&D. It's all the time of the engineers who are building this. That's true for many different kinds of products, especially if it's, you know, kind of a standard CRUD, CRUD web app. You know, you're just storing data and serving it and, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of engagements. But if you really think carefully about the business you're in, especially if you're in one of those, I collect a billion discrete little pieces of data and I need to ETL them and get them in the reporting and act on them, et cetera, your unit costs are really important. Believe me, I know in the MarTech ad tech space, unit costs are the name of the game because you're dealing not even in billions, you're dealing in trillions, trillions of impressions. So you have to think about this. You can't not think about it. You have to make sure you've got only the state you need in order to deal with those trillions in the time frame and on the scale that's useful for you. The other thing is do as much offline versus online as your product value proposition will allow. So that's the difference between offline and online. Synchronous and asynchronous. So how much has to happen as this little tiny piece of information comes in and needs to be satisfied versus how much can be done in the big BI database a week later, or a day later, or a few hours later uh, that's off of that critical path. And what's really important by that is that determines how hot your data needs to be. If your data is cold, it's cheap. It's hot, it's expensive. So if it has to happen right there, boom, uh, then you know, that's going to cost you money. So again, case in point in the ad tech world, what is often the, you know, so often the case is you've got bidders, uh, or in our case, software that needs to be able to compute a redirect really quickly. Well, that redirect needs to happen on the scale of milliseconds. 
And so when you have a redirect that needs to happen on the scale of milliseconds, generally you need to stay in memory or at least be co-located on the node that's actually servicing the request, which means it's in memory, which means it's expensive to keep that data, which means you want to keep that data set and those lookups as constrained and localized as possible. If you try to attach you know, a, 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 you know, a 50 terabyte you know, SSD on these, you're not only going to get slow performance, but you're also going to just, you're, you're going to kill yourself in cost. So again, relating this to experiences at Tune. So, um, <laughs> we were a very, very good Dynamo data DB customer. How many folks here have used Dynamo DB? Let's get some calisthenics in. All right. Um, very, very good Dynamo DB uh, uh, customer. I've met uh, at least two of the people who have written the Dynamo DB white paper. We were such good uh, Dynamo DB customers. And um, you know, that's in part because we were just keeping too much darn data in the hot store. We're keeping the entire attributed history of a user in hot DynamoDB storage. And the way that our DynamoDB uh, tables were structured, that meant keeping a lot of provision capacity across terabytes and terabytes of data, which costs a lot of money. So again, this involves going back to this and saying, do we actually need this whole history to be queryable for what this online process needs to do as it is receiving attribution messages. And turned out the answer was not really, or certainly not that much of it. We only really needed 45 days of it. So chopping that down and chopping that down uh, produced huge dividends. We're talking about $250,000, $300,000 a month kind of dividends very quickly uh, in terms of relieving things out of that hot storage. Uh, other cases where we've, uh, we, where we've um, used kind of storage refactoring, I mentioned that cold store, making sure that that is in a trustable place. Uh, one of the things we've spent the most time on, again, while we've been replacing the tires in the proverbial moving truck, uh, has been on getting that safety net right. Uh, we've had a lot of success in just getting everything separated in a uh, hive, hive structured, um, meaning uh, the actual uh, folder partition structure uh, is Hive compatible, but a Hive structured by year, month, date, customer ID, Parquet store. So Parquet data, that's, that's how we're storing everything on our end. And you know, Parquet is not the world's greatest file format. It's got pluses and minuses. If you ever read the Parquet white paper, there are uh, certainly give and take in structuring your data that way, but it is extremely well supported by data science and BI and ETL tools. So you never need to write an adapter to get data out of it. You can just point Athena at it, or you can put your Databricks instance at it, or your Spark instance at it, uh, if you're, you're running Spark yourself through EMR or however, or whatever tool you're using, chances are they're going to read Parquet. And they're going to understand the Hive nomenclature for how to figure out the partitions on your Parquet. That's going to save you a lot of time. It's going to save you a lot of uh, anxiety when it comes to dealing with any of these warmer stores upstream because you've got faith in your base to be able to cube something warmer uh, in case you ever mess with it or in case you want to build something new. So we've put tremendous investment in it and that's done two things. Uh, one is that the system itself is actually very efficient and surprisingly with tools like Snowflake loading off that parquet, uh, we can actually just query that raw data in things like Snowflake or directly with Athena using some really, really cheap queries. Uh, and the second thing uh, that we can do is delete stuff. We can just get rid of these stores further upstream because we can have faith that we can always build them later if we need to. In a lot of cases, we don't need to, and that saves us money. Use cloud services mindfully. So yes, cloud services cost more than self-hosting in the abstract. And Yes, using provider-specific services do make it very hard to migrate elsewhere, staple services. So just be mindful of that. If you get locked in, you know, it is, in the abstract, more expensive to do this stuff in AWS than if you get some metal you know, sitting in the rack somewhere in a colo. That's absolutely uh, true. A couple of things to remember, though, is that it's elastic, which needs to go both ways. It's flexible in scaling up, but that should also translate into flexible in scaling down. And good tooling makes that possible. And conveniently enough, that same good tooling actually makes you more cloud agnostic, too. So if you've got everything running in EKS, congratulations. All of your stateless systems are already containerized. 
They are already stateless. You've made sure that they are stateless. And you've got to run them in Kubernetes. So if you're running your Kubernetes in EKS, it's a much smaller hop to go from there to running it on you know, Kubernetes cluster in GCP or on your own self-hosted Kubernetes cluster and wherever that may be uh, than if you're doing bare metal deployments onto an EC2 instance using Puppet or something like that. You're a lot closer to being able to move uh, over. So your tooling really opens up the world for you if you do it right. The part that's the hardest to move is the stateful stuff. If you're using Bigtable uh, or if you're using Redshift or if you're using DynamoDB or one of the platform provider specific state solutions, then you're going to have a hard time moving that. You're going to have a real hard time moving that because the performance characteristics are going to be different. So you know, that's the part where you start to lock in. So again, use it mindfully. Just remember, you might have noticed if you've watched any of the NFL in the last year or walked through an airport uh, that uh, AWS has started to advertise. Uh, why is AWS starting to advertise? It's because they're under pressure. Because GCP and Google are spending a ton of money to try to gobble market share. It's because Azure and Microsoft are spending a ton of money to try to gobble market share. Negotiate. Always remember to negotiate. Um, remember also, there are always gotchas in pricing and it's very possible to accidentally stick yourself with a huge cost spike. Uh, ask me how I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, we'll talk about this when we get to the Pennywise Pound Foolish segment, but uh, there are always little spikes in the pricing. And this goes back to your tooling. Your tooling can actually let you know if you see a cost spike happen. Uh, if there's something unexpected happening with your bill, your tooling can give you an alert on that the same way it can give you an alert that your uh, Cassandra cluster is down or that your HDFS instance has blown up or a thousand other things. So, at Tune, cloud services mindfully, uh, there's all sorts of stories uh, around this. Um, we've really invested in platform infrastructure. And when we talk about the platform in infrastructure bit uh, later, it really has manifested itself in being able to scale up and down. We used to use EC2 a lot for systems that were our main tracking ingestion pipeline. And they weren't as stateless as they needed to be, which is to say they should have been completely stateless and they weren't. So making them stateless and then containerizing them and then getting them into an auto-scaling group and then later into Kubernetes outright translated into big savings. Because instead of having the provision for the peak, and we have you know, pretty standard kind of sinusoidal wave in terms of our traffic, where you know, they deal with 80 or 100,000 RPS hitting these systems, you can ride the wave. And if you have faith in your systems to ride the wave, then you can ride the wave. But if you don't have your faith in your systems to be productionized well enough to go up when the water starts to get high, then you're just going to leave it provisioned for the peak. And you know, just getting the calculus textbook out, if you compute the integral of the curve, that's all money that you've left on the table. Fifth thing. Don't go the self-hosted route unless you are committed. Ask me how I know. Um, so I, as I mentioned, yeah, cloud services cost more than self-hosting in the abstract. But uh, maintaining your own infrastructure requires special internal expertise. Uh, for example, if you were just in the lightning talks, you need to know how to weld uh, in order to uh, do self-hosting. I guess not that many folks here in the lightning talks. Or the joke wasn't that funny. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, but anyway, right, um, you need special skills to do it. And again, the whole point is you're giving up a lot in cost flexibility because now instead of using the elasticity of a cloud, you are taking on the ownership of the metal yourself. Uh, there is some cost flexibility, but it's a lot more work and it's a lot more effort. And the thing, of course, is especially if you're trying to run across the two or some sort of migration path across the two, you might be talking with somebody who you know, says, hey, we've got a gigabit link into uh, you know, AWS's mystery region, US East 1, which is probably not in Blacksburg, Virginia, maybe. Um, they've got a gigabit link in. It'll be great, super interoperable. But uh, that's not really useful if the things that those systems need to consume are all being emitted from SQS. Uh, you know, there's a lot of gotchas that will prevent that sort of interoperability. So only go that route if you are committed to dealing with those gotchas. 
So if you don't have a great handle on your future capacity needs or you aren't willing to hire the staff with the skills to manage a colo or a data center, stop, 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 stop. Uh, ask me how I know. Um, we, um, we learned this one the hard way. Uh, because again, our you know, 2014, 2015, costs going up, 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 up. Thought is, hey, we're a big scale company, you know, we're you know, a big venture funded company, we're dealing with huge scale, hockey stick, hockey stick, it's time we did this ourselves. And so, got a great deal on, you know, uh, uh, you know, some provision space in the data center and a bunch of hardware therein and had ops folks crawling around it, getting racks set up and getting all the different things necessary to maintain that sort of presence. You know, the networking, uh, you know, the UPSs, the disk spaces required, all of those things for that access. And we never came close to full utilization of that. It was always a distraction. It was never a, a, an element of cost savings. It just cost us time and energy. Uh, again, if you go that route, you need to be committed, which means you need to make sure you're gonna figure out all the things to make it work. Don't go down there lightly. Six, fix the organizational dynamics around cost. So cloud services do a great job at abstracting you from all sorts of things. And one of the things that it abstracts you from is what the actual cost implications are of what you're doing. Uh, it's really easy to write something that can make an e you know, a, a Kubernetes cluster just go big and big and big and not really know that that's what's happening or might put all sorts of data in the spot that might not really be aware of what's doing or land a job, no clue of any of it. It just does its thing. Um, so if you're gonna go that route, the, with, the, um, with the elasticity, you actually need to put some organizational awareness around what good practices are and what good awareness is. I know this is exciting. I'm sure everyone came here for an engineering talk. Instead, you're getting a boring uh, dad watching the thermostat lecture. But, uh, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, this is important. Again, um, the, you know, we do these things mostly because we wanna solve problems. And, you know, these are all the problems around the actual engineering that has to happen. This is engineering, but it's of kind of a different stripe. So uh, when you're scaling rapidly, again, it's so easy to uh, put the credit card in reach and get out to get out of engineering problems, but you need practices around this. And again, good tooling can make these practices possible without hurting velocity. Um, so case in point, how many folks here are familiar with Terraform? How many folks here are familiar with uh, with uh, infrastructure as code more generally. So one of the great things about infrastructure as code is all of the same things you do to make sure code is good quality, you can now do for your infrastructure as well, which means instead of having to file paperwork to provision you know, the uh, you know, new EKS policy that you need, or the new IAM policy, or the EC2 nodes you need, or new EBS blocks or whatever, you can submit a merge request. And that merge request is gonna get peer reviewed. Same as what your code will. And that means that the same practices that you follow to put good quality code can now be applied to build good quality infrastructure as well, uh, which is really convenient because then you makes it much more easy to be mindful of cost in the same way that you're mindful of writing good quality maintainable code. Um, you also you know, need to make sure that someone is watching the till and they have both authority and responsibility over that. Again, from an organizational dynamics perspective, one of the worst things you can possibly do is give someone responsibility for something without the authority to do anything about meeting their responsibility. That's just one of those big underlying things when it comes to building any kind of engineering organization. And uh, you know, it gets harder and harder to do. At this point, uh, especially you know, at this point in Tune's life, we had an engineering organization of about 140 people and you need to make sure that you're building an organization that is capable of, uh, of moving quickly and moving well without blowing things up. So ask me how I know. Uh, at Tune, all sorts of different things uh, have come about it. So up, up until late in 2016, we actually had a circumstance where we were trying to, to do a copy to set up that cold storage net that I've been talking about. And in doing that cold storage net, uh, one of our data engineers uh, you know, was trying to meet a tight deadline, was trying to meet a sprint commitment, and spun up 128 M44 XLs that were running uh, 24 hours a day, just unchecked. Uh, I'm not sure how many folks know how much M44 XL costs per hour, especially uh, if it's not a reserved instance, but you can spend a lot of money running 120, 128 M44 XLs. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can spend uh, 
hundreds of thousands of dollars running uh, M4 or 4XLs in that quantity. Uh, and so, you know, c comes the old adage that, uh, you know, as a company, you require uh, a receipt to get a $15 taxi ride reimbursed, but you can easily spend $100,000 in EC2, and it's no big D. Um, you, know, you know, obviously, it's a bit of an extreme uh, statement, but uh, the truth is, those kinds of controls, you either learn to put them there the easy way or the hard way. We elected to do it the hard way, but the point is, the reason why those controls weren't there is because we needed them to move fast. So how do you reconcile that? You reconcile it with tooling. And that's what we ultimately did. At first, we did the whole paperwork thing. You've got to file a JIRA tick, and then the ops team will give you the, the instances. And it does slow everything down. There's no getting around it. Um, but with Terraform and with infrastructure as code and a lot of the practices we built around that, and by investing in the tooling around all this, we managed to get around that pain. Uh, number seven, watch your vendor cost, too. Uh, if there's any, anything I can pass on to anyone here, I'm not sure how many folks here ever have to negotiate with vendors, but negotiate with vendors. Uh, they always have a better rate than what you get quoted. Never take a list price as a list price in this world in software. It's easy to say, oh, it says on the website it's 30 bucks a head. If you're talking with someone to buy from them, the price is negotiable. Believe me, if you've been in SaaS software, you know the price is negotiable because your own sales team is busy negotiating those prices and being haggled down every day. So be that person on the other side of the fence. Put the shoe on the other foot. Uh, and do that in any engagement that, uh, that you dive into if you're ever actually looking to buy things. Uh, also, always consider alternatives. The strength of your negotiation is determined by uh, how well you can go elsewhere. That's your leverage. If you don't have that, you have no leverage, you have no ability to negotiate, you're going to get a bad rate. So always consider alternatives for anything you look at. Just faint in that direction. Um, you know, we take more calls from other cloud providers when, you know, timing is appropriate for us. Uh, but always consider alternatives when you can. Also, uh, only buy the things that you use. So it's so often to buy, be like, oh, it'd be great if we had this thing, we get the support, we get the blah, we get the blah. If you're not using the support, if you're not using the enterprise capabilities, don't pay for them. Uh, you can save yourself tens or hundreds of thousand dollars that way. Uh, ask me how I know it too, because we used to pay for a lot of that stuff, and now we don't, and it hasn't made a single difference for just about all those different things that we negotiated over. Uh, it really is something to be completely mindful for. Uh, eight, good infrastructure tooling produces cheaper and better infrastructure. I belabored this one pretty hard, so I don't think I need to, to get too, uh, too much more into this, but again, We've already talked about how good infrastructure enables better elasticity. We've talked about how good infrastructure can make you more cloud agnostic. Um, again, what we have, the stack that we have at Tune, we've emphasized, again, getting everything containerized, getting everything uh, manageable through Kubernetes, using Terraform uh, as our uh, infrastructure as code platform with the plugins that are relevant to our environment. Uh, and then for logging and alerting, you know, using uh, Datadog, which has been a terrific vendor to work with for our metrics and our alerting, and the Elk stack for our actual log tracking. And you know, just by using these tools well and investing in the usage of them and build, you know, really truly having a, a DevOps team that builds tools that our teams can build around, it does pay dividends. You have to invest in it for the long term uh, because it will be painful at the beginning. Uh, trying to go from startup world where, you know, if you can SSH into it, you, you know, you go, you do you, team. You got a commitment to, a sprint commitment to me onto this form. But if you do have the right folks to pull it off and you do invest in it, you can actually get to the other side of the learning curve. We've seen it happen to Tune. We went through the pain, but now we're into the profits and it's amortized itself 50 times over uh, just in the last year. Uh, and finally, uh, don't get penny wise and pound foolish. So I'm just going to start uh, with uh, a cautionary tale. So we mentioned moving things around state. There was a, a small amount of data we had for legal holds. So you know, someone wants to pursue action against someone else. And since we're a data processor, we have to keep that data around until the subpoena ends. Well, we figure out oh, you know, this data is costing us like 600 bucks a month. Let's throw it in Glacier. That's going to save us you know, most of that money. You know, it'll take a couple days to do. No big deal. Uh, Glacier charges by the put and get. 
And the way the data was structured, it had many tiny little files uh, that we had to upload as part of that copy. So in doing that $600 a month savings, we got a Glacier data access bill of $47,000. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, so, you know, again, this is where knowledge is power. Uh, know the engineering investment that it takes to pull things off and know how much it really is going to save you. Uh, I think I speak for everyone here, especially given how glassy-eyed uh, I think most folks are in this talk at this point, that we'd all rather be building things. Uh, I think we'd all rather be building technology. We'd all rather be uh, you know, focused less on this kind of level of efficiency and, and thermostat twiddling and more about actually making things that are exciting for customers. So focus on the things that give you the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, and you need to know the size of the bang uh, for that buck, and you need to know the amount of effort it's going to take you to get there, which goes to engineering processes, but also having the data of what is meaningful. So for example, right now, uh, we've got a, a system that we use for, for data log export that we've migrated from Elasticsearch onto Snowflake. And Snowflake has been another terrific vendor of ours uh, for distributed data access. Uh, it's going to save us some excellent cash. It's been worth the, you know, few engineering months of team time necessary to do that migration. We've got some other systems that aren't maybe the best systems, the most efficient systems, but it's going to take two months to replace them, and it's going to save us $1,000 a month. Two engineering months is a pretty expensive thing. It takes a long time for $1,000 a month to compensate for two engineering months' worth of effort. Um, and so just make sure that you know the calculus of the trade-off, because what you should be doing while this is all going on is building new things for your customers, maintaining product market fit, and worrying less about this boring stuff I just yak your ear off about. So I already gave you the, uh, the ask me how you know. Uh, what was the outcome of all of this? So this story, as I mentioned, did have a happy ending. It does have a happy ending. Uh, 18 months after our cost peak in December 2016, traffic continued to increase at a similar rate, but our actual uh, overall cost of goods sold, so the other side of that, uh, or I should say specifically our server cost, not our overall cost of goods sold, uh, decreased by 55%. Uh, so, you know, in, in some ways, again, because we were in cloud jail, there were a lot of pieces of low hanging fruit for us to be able to grab. Uh, but that's another thing to be mindful of is, if you've been reaching for that credit card, uh, it's, a, it's pretty easy to stop the kind of profligate spending because, uh, again, the lower hanging fruit is there to grab. Uh, and we grabbed it and we kept going. And we managed to do that uh, without um, you know, letting the uh, truck derail because its tires weren't on because actually uh, appreciation, appreciation of the product increased uh, over that time frame. Uh, and it's continued to, actually. It's, uh, it's, it's been a pretty strong uh, couple of uh, years. So, um, anyway, that, that's kind of where we've gotten for all of this. If there's any takeaway, uh, again, for the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, fans in the crowd, is if you do end up in cloud jail, don't panic. Don't panic. It is possible to get out of it um, by basically conscientious diligence. Uh, two words that arouse a fiery passion, I know, and just about anybody, conscientious diligence. Uh, but uh, it's what it takes. It's just what it takes. And, um, if you don't panic, you just work through, get your tooling set up, use things mindfully, make sure engineering and product are working together in the decisions you're making, uh, you'll get out of cloud jail. And you can spend more time focusing on the things you'd rather be doing, which is building customer value. And uh, so at this point, we're going to sidle on over to the Q&A over on Slido, 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 something. Um, needs a pronunciation key. And uh, let's take a gander, shall we? All right. Um, so uh, one question is, how much space was eight years of data taking? I'll blow that up. Uh, how much space was eight years of data taking? Uh, well, we had a few copies of it floating around, another thing that we could save. But um, uh, we were at our largest point, I think, at two and a half petabytes. So we had, you know, Pretty substantial amount of data uh, floating around. Um, does AWS Trusted Advisor show any savings? So we looked at some of the services that will help you, you know, slice down your bill. Um, generally, 
These services are useful if you haven't already done your diligence about where your costs are. So I mentioned you know, axiom number three, two, two. Uh, knowledge is power, get your visibility. Uh, if you need that and you don't have it, AWS Trusted Advisor and some of the other uh, kind of third party uh, uh, platforms that are out there can be really useful in helping you get that understanding. Um, once you've got it, eh, mostly they're just gonna tell you something you already know. Uh, and then they're gonna take mm, your savings, uh, uh, tithe out of your savings. So, uh, you know, that was our kind of experience with it. Um, what's the biggest vendor price cut you've been able to negotiate? Fortunately, it's under NDA, so I can't, I can't quite tell you uh, what it was, but it was substantial. 60% of um, a uh, seven-figure annual bill uh, that we managed to negotiate down. So, uh, again, you just, just negotiate. Don't worry. No one's going to think you're a jerk in those kinds of uh, discussions. Uh, these folks, especially your account managers who are on their side of, uh, of any SaaS platform, they do this every day. So uh, don't be the mark uh, in those uh, relationships. Go after it. Uh, and just put on your hard hat and uh, get every uh, nickel you can, because uh, it's just life. Um, all right, well, we're, we're at the end of the train of questions. So um, for those of you who have any uh, follow-up questions or want to catch up with me afterwards, I'm just Dan K at Tune. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for your time this afternoon. Thank you.